the United States is sending heavy combat equipment into Eastern Europe. It is the Pentagon's most significant move in the region since the end of the Cold War. Russian President Vladimir Putin announced last week that Moscow would add 40 intercontinental ballistic missiles to its nuclear arsenal. We will stand up to Russia's actions and their attempts to reestablish a Soviet era sphere of influence. The U.S. will arm six countries, Romania, Estonia, Bulgaria, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, in order to prevent the type of assault that Russia launched in Ukraine. In response, we're taking a strong but balanced strategic approach. The United States and its NATO allies are getting dangerously close to a high-risk military confrontation with Russia over the current crisis in the Ukraine. A situation that can escalate at any moment and drive the world into a catastrophic and global conflict. And we are joined now by Paul Craig Roberts. I wanted to get your take on all this because a very dangerous situation going on right now in the Ukraine, a standoff between the U.S. and Russia. And to me, it, it looks like a, the beginning of a, a modern-day Cuban Missile Crisis, if you will. What do you think? Well, I think it's uh, worse than that. You know, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis was easy to reconcile mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, the, the, the Americans had recently stuck missiles in Turkey <laughs> on Russia's border. And so this was um, Khrushchev uh, responding to that with the intention of getting the missile bases out of Turkey. <laughs> which, which he, which he did, yeah. But you did. So I don't think that crisis was ever as dangerous as we were told, because I think that uh, both Khrushchev and Kennedy understood that uh, nuclear war, one way or the other, would destroy life on Earth, and they weren't interested in it. In those days, Washington did not have the hubris or the image of itself as the indispensable, exceptional country with the right to exercise hegemony over the world. Washington knew full well it didn't have any hegemony over Russia or Russia's allies. And so it kept things in balance. But you see, today, all that balance is gone. Well, today we have the neocons. And, and most people, when they That's think of neocons, they think of the Bush administration but you and I both know that they're alive and well within the Obama administration as well. And I think the scariest part about the neocons, they actually believe that they could win a nuclear exchange with Russia. Am I right? That's exactly right. They do believe that. And that's why they had uh, United States uh, strategic doctrine changed, because in our strategic doctrine, nuclear weapons were a retaliatory force that you only used if you were under nuclear attack. But now, the neocons have changed the doctrine, and nuclear weapons are a preemptive first strike force. Well, this tells Russia and China that the Americans might launch a preemptive attack on us. Yeah. Yeah, they, to destabilize the region. And I want to play a clip for you right now. And this goes back when the, the conflict first started in Kiev, when Obama addressed the American people. And he said that the, the U.S., they were just interested in what's best for the Ukrainian people because, uh, after all, the Ukrainian people, they just want to be left alone. Let's check it out. The United States has been responding to events as they unfold in Ukraine. Now, throughout this crisis, we have been very clear about one fundamental principle. The Ukrainian people deserve the opportunity to determine their own future. Human beings have a universal right to determine their own future. It would represent a profound interference in matters that must be determined by the Ukrainian people. Yes. So, <laughs> I mean, it really is laughable, and it sounds to me like the beginnings of yet another uh, U.S. humanitarian effort out there in the Ukraine. <laughs> so, I mean, give me a break. Obama has no interest, and in, in, he's not looking after the best interest of the Ukrainian people, right? Now, this is the guy who's je whose government has just overthrown the elected democratic government of Ukraine. Yeah, there you go. This is, he's just oh, So here's a brand new country with democracy. It's hardly taken root. And so what does he teach them? Oh, well, force can overthrow democracy. <laughs> <laughs>
So, so I mean, uh, this this is uh, it's hilarious, but of course it's criminal. And that was a message to the American people. Of course, the people in the Ukraine aren't buying it, but unfortunately, the people are so dumbed down and ignorant here in the United States that that most of them are going to buy it, even even on the the right. Yeah, especially on the right. Yeah, you know. <clears throat> Americans are unaware that Ukraine has been part of Russia for longer than the United States has existed. <laughs> yeah. And Ukraine was separated out of Russia in the early 1990s when the Soviet collapse left Russia powerless and the and Washington was able to work its will. So they broke out Ukraine, they broke out Georgia, uh, and now they're committed to actually destroying the whole Russian Federation in order to prevent uh, the rise uh, of a country with sufficient resources and size and power to operate as a constraint against Washington's purposes in the world. So the whole thing, you see, is orchestrated by Washington as a way of trying to prevent Russia's rise. You know, Ukraine is now used for sanctions to break off uh, Russia's economic and political relationships with Europe in order to uh, keep Europe under America's thumb rather than lose them to Russian, uh, lose them to dependency on Russian energy. So this whole thing is an operation against Russia. It's a propaganda operation. Now, the forces that Washington and NATO are putting on uh, Russia's borders. Uh, uh, <laughs> these forces have no <clears throat> capability whatsoever of ta taking on the Russian army. Uh, well, of the course not. And, and, and Putin's not <laughs> stupid. He knows what's going on. He knows the United States government, the CIA, and the military industrial complex. They have a long history of overthrowing governments uh, taking over countries by destabilizing the region, just like we've done recently in Libya, uh, Iraq, uh, right now in Syria, doing the same thing in the Ukraine. So he's not stupid. What's to stop Russia from a Pearl Harbor style uh, surprise sneak attack? I mean, do you think they're just going to lay down quietly and just let us run over them? What are they prepared to do? No, they're not going to be run over, but they're not going to do anything provocative. I think they realize that this is a propaganda campaign serving Washington, whose power is on the way, and that Washington is desperate <clears throat> to hold on to its empire, which is Europe and, and Japan, <laughs> Canada and Australia. <clears throat> and they're just going to let it go. And if it actually came to war, it would be the end of Europe. Yeah. There's no way Europe would survive. <laughs> if there's a war breaks out with Russia, Europe is a wasteland. No, I, I hear you. And before we go, one last question. Yeah, I know you, you worked with the, uh, or for the Reagan administration. You were very close to Ronald Reagan. It must be night and day to look at the Obama administration now compared to, to working with Reagan. What are some of the biggest differences? And did you ever think you'd live to see the day where so much corruption would run rampant in the White House? No. But it's not just Obama. It was George W. Bush. Oh, sure. And it was Clinton. You know, all this trouble started with Clinton's second term. He's the one who took NATO to Russia's borders in violation of the guarantees given by George Herbert Walker Bush and Secretary of State James Baker. So all the trouble started in Clinton's second term. And since then, we really haven't had a president. <laughs> and... Uh, the, the differences are, are massive. You know, when I was there, to have a government official stand up in public and lie through his teeth, <laughs> even if the media hadn't called him on it, his colleagues would have. Sure. And, but today, they all stand up and lie through their teeth. In fact, they never say anything is true.